All right. Well, welcome today to the Academic Skills Expert panel discussions. And uh, today we're going to talk about Trent ESL's um, EAP program, our English for Academic Purposes program. And so part of what uh, makes the Trent ESL program unique and effective is its approach to skills instruction, um, especially in levels four and five, which is where we hone in on English for academic purposes. Not only does our program include innovative workshop-based classes like grammar workshop and university transitions, uh, but we've created two separate streams to ramp up productive skills and receptive skills. And so uh, productive skills we call academic communication and receptive skills we call academic analysis. And both of these uh, streams are uh, geared towards preparing students for academic studies. So Trent ESL's T-Bell uh, teacher training course will benefit uh, from these video recordings of insiders look at how we teach receptive skills and productive skills. And uh, these sessions will be recorded and embedded into lessons, which will draw out key concepts in academic skills instruction, as well as vocabulary and language skills uh, targets relevant to the discussion. And so first, uh, before we get going with the discussion, I think that as panelists, we should introduce ourselves. And so I've asked each uh, panelist to talk about uh, what they bring to this uh, discussion. So let's start with Lori. Sure. So my name is Lori Steers, and I've been teaching at Trent's ESL program for seven years. Prior to that, I worked in publishing, in sales and marketing for 14 years, so I think I bring a slightly different real-world real perspective to my teaching, for sure. Breton? Hi, Lori. Hi, I'm Breton Clark. I'm an instructor and academic liaison at Trent University. Uh, I've been teaching ESL... Um, both abroad and across Canada for 10 years, uh, have experience working in private schools and in a university setting internationally and in Canada as well. And uh, I like to bring um, a strong experiential approach, uh, both philosophically and practically. Um, I've got uh, a master's degree in experiential education. And uh, from a practical perspective as well, I believe in the importance of, uh, of doing uh, as you learn and learning by doing. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about what I bring. Yeah, I'm Tamara Al Casey, and uh, before I was an ESL teacher, I spent uh, about 14, 15 years uh, in in um, academic courses teaching Spanish as a foreign language. So um, I've been on both sides of the table, so to speak. So I've worked with uh, credit courses, and so I have a good perspective of what students need to be ready for mm -hmm. when they leave our program. And my name is Andrew Keane. Uh, I've only been at Trent at ESL program for a year, but I've worked in language schools in Canada, working with uh, students from abroad, as well as over 10 years experience working in Korea and Japan at language schools and universities there. So bringing that foreign experience and uh, being able to use it in the ESL programs here. And I'm Glenda Fish, and uh, for most of my career, in fact, all of my career, I guess, I have um, been in sort of two worlds. I've been in the world of uh, diploma or degree studies and uh, the world of ESL. And so um, in teaching English for academic purposes, I sort of bring those two worlds together. Okay, so let's get down to the heart of the matter and uh, tackle our first question. So, um, Breton... Um, how does receptive skills instruction factor into EAP at Trent? Um, it's in ultimately familiarizing students with different types of texts, particularly the ones that they're going to have to to be to deal with on a on a daily basis in all of their undergraduate classes. So whether that's, I mean, for a lot of them, it might be reading out of dense notebooks or, or textbooks rather for for undergraduate classes. Um, getting more and more familiar with primary research or um, ac you know other academic publications from uh, uh, from from peer edited journals and that type of thing. Um, also skills as well, um, note taking skills in particular, uh, being able to synthesize information from a variety of sources. Because often I hear from 
from students that have matriculated from our program and head into the, their undergrad, the, the, the lectures uh, are totally different from our textbook and, and the test is about both of them and it's, it's quite complicated. And so uh, I, think, uh, I think synthesis uh, of, of different sources is, is crucial, especially when, uh, when taking notes. Um, yeah, but th there's all there's there's so many ways. I, guess, I think so. authenticity maybe is a really important thing to mention. Yeah. So we're using we're not using materials that have been created for um, a, a, an English language textbook. We're using materials that are coming directly from academic sources in some cases, mm -hmm. such as the uh, lectures. Um, and uh, we are using, for example, in my courses, I'm sometimes bringing in having students uh, find a first year textbook and bring that in as background material for a particular, for a particular segment. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on, on critical thinking or critical reading? I'd say definitely in these higher level classes for their, when they are doing the readings, they've been used to reading to understand the words, the, what's the meaning, but now they have to go beyond that and think about, well, what's the author trying to say, as well as, Hmm. What are they, have they really thought about this in a, I want to say this, uh, has the author said this uh, from knowledge or have they really ed um, done good research to find this material or the student has to think about, well, what is this, is this really uh, the best way that they've done this or is this the best way that, not the best way, but <laughs> the student has to think about uh, how has the author uh, written this and have they researched mm. this well? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, totally. No, research shows that um, that receptive skills instruction in ESL does further uh, uh, critical thinking skills and critical reading skills for sure. I mean, uh, in general English, the focus is on content, understanding, comprehension. Um, but then in EAP, it sort of pushes beyond those types of strategies into... Um, like, like Andrew said, an awareness of the author's purpose, mm -hmm. um, so functional strategies. And then as you progress in your undergraduate degree and even in the higher levels of ESL, rhetorical awareness, like uh, those types of strategies, like what, not only what was the purpose here, what was the author's intent, but, but uh, what intended effect is that supposed to have in, in the reader's mind? You know, is this a convincing argument, facts and opinions and uh, that type of thing? So for sure, I agree that um, the receptive skills does further a, a critical thinking agenda. Well, they're also looking at uh, these receptive skills as the what they're reading as models for what they are then going to write. Totally. So we mm -hmm. model good research skills yep. by having them look at a research paper, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you find you use modeling in uh, grammar workshop, Lori? You mean modeling of, like showing them writing models? Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, a little bit. Actually, yes, we do. Often we will use models of prior uh, year students' work, as an example, mm -hmm. or we will use examples of research that was written to show them how reported speech is used when you're reporting um, other researchers' opinions. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do, actually, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think models are very important. Mm -hmm. So even though we don't think of Grammar Workshop as being necessarily receptive. We often pair it with with productive. I think there is a, even a receptive aspect Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think all four skills, even though we, we tend to divide our courses uh, along receptive and productive lines, inevitably you get all four skills in all courses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's turn our attention a little bit to vocabulary. We haven't um, really thought much about um, vocabulary and how vocabulary figures in uh, receptive skills. Um, yeah, I'd say vocabulary is, um, students have often been given the vocabulary that they need before reading something in the lower levels, but now the students need to start learning, how do I uh, look at some of the vocabulary before I read something by myself, how do I um, have student autonomy in, in learning these skills, uh, find the vocabulary that I'm going to need about the subject before I do the reading, as well as once I've started doing the reading, knowing how to uh, reading the vocabulary in context. Maybe I can pull out the meaning while I'm reading 
the article, um, as well as then if I still cannot understand it properly, knowing where to find uh, proper meanings and, and deepening my vocabulary. Um, so. I think there's a real switch also at level four and five to a more academic vocabulary oh, and the definitely. academic word list mm -hmm. and the word families, and when you're tackling vocabulary, we look at parts of words, the prefix and the suffix and the root, so that you can build a vocabulary, not just learning word by word and memorizing, but learning groups of vocabulary. And you need a, um, you need a different precision uh, for dealing with academic work as well. So uh, I've even created a, a list of forbidden words so that students can't use words like people and interesting and important. Yes. They've got to be become more precise so that they can show their critical thinking. Sometimes I say to students, um, you've used the, f there's a $5 word and there's a $100 word. So instead <laughs> of saying really, what's the $100 word way of saying really? And then they learn extremely or significantly. Okay, before we close off this um, segment, let's uh, sort of uh, just go around and uh, talk about our favorite activities that facilitate receptive skills instruction. Sure. So who wants to go first? I'll start. Okay. I really like to use authentic texts in particular um, <clears throat> I teach probably listening more than reading, so I'll speak to that. I like to use a lot of authentic listening materials, such as TED Talks and CBC documentaries and radio programs and um, pods. Um, and so I sometimes prepare activities to go along with these listening activities. And in particular, one activity that I found was very successful was I send students out to go and listen to an actual academic lecture at mm. Trent. So each student picks a different lecture that they are interested in, and they sit in the lecture and take notes, and then they have to report back to the other students how that felt. Mm. Breton? You mentioned podcasts. I like having students make recordings of their own presentations um, because I think that has a sort of a dual a dual purpose. So there's two objectives there. One, it gives them a sense of their own skills. I mean, I, I recognize that that's not strictly so speaking a, a receptive skill. It's more of like a focus on oh, how's my pronunciation or how's my grammar accuracy. You know, it forces them to listen to themselves, which not every student mm -hmm. always gets a chance to do. Um, but also it um, you know, it provides it, it it provides a variety of of sources or a variety of texts, if you will, for for the rest of the class. And so, um, mm -hmm. it's it's not necessarily an alternative to doing a presentation, but uh, because you need to the stand and deliver skills, the body language, and the presence of being in front of a lot of people, that's crucial. But this is a it's a it's a it's a good experience for to create it, and then for the rest of the students as well as a listening. One of my favorite things to do is maybe you could think of it as kind of an extended reading. Um, I like to work with textbook chapters that students will actually, they will really be like the material students will be dealing with in their first year. So they need to read an entire chapter in a textbook that fits with the discipline that we're covering in that particular unit. For example, a first year psychology textbook. Um, another one of my favorites uh, for, that I use for for listening to a lecture is I will create an actual uh, handout based on a PowerPoint and students have this handout just like they might in a lecture and they're filling it in as they listen. Um, I was going to carry on from how Breton was saying that to listen, if they're making a podcast that they're going to be listening to their own voice is having students, if they did do that, to, um, listening to other sources as well and they're so used to listening for the general meaning and understanding the general meaning, but then sometimes going down and uh, writing down what are the actual sentences that the person said, and so getting, can they actually hear the, the small words in between the, the main content words, and this helps their listening skills. It can also help with the, the grammar to understand that how the sentence was made up, but uh, it can take a while to, to analyze even just five minutes of, of listening that way, but it can give them a, a deeper knowledge of how is those sentences put together. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for your thoughts. What about you, Glenda? <laughs> 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 Thanks, Fretton. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I guess what I uh, really uh, like is um, in uh, in our level five, we really focus on critical reading skills, and I really uh, like this whole notion of analyzing an article and really thinking about, um, you know, who was the writer who wrote this, and did they have a particular uh, bias when they wrote it, and so therefore, is it trustworthy or not? And just going through all of those sort of critical reading uh, questions that we look at, and that sort of moment of aha that students have when they realize, oh, this writer might be biased, or oh, this evidence really isn't very strong. So I like that aha moment. Okay, well, thank you for your thoughts on uh, receptive skills. Thanks, Linda. Well, welcome to part two of our panel discussion on receptive skills in EAP. So uh, this time we want to talk about resources. Um, so to Tamara, I know you're big on finding resources. So I wondered if you could describe your approach to sourcing genuine reading and listening materials for your classes. Well, when I think back to the pre-internet days, uh, it was just a different world. Uh, we have so many resources available to us. Um, we can go to TED Talks. We can go to MOOCs. Uh, but I think one of the most interesting uh, lecture sources that we have are some of the sources that have been created especially for us. So students... And by can, us. And by us, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we can, uh, our students can experience a, a Trent University lecture that's directly connected to the topic that they are seeing, that they are, that they are studying. Uh, and as well, they can access uh, the same kinds of materials that they will encounter in the classroom. So uh, course material, textbook material, online uh, research material. Mm. Um, there's just a wealth of material out there that we can access to bring into our students. Mm -hmm. Lori, I wondered if you might have something to say about textbooks in EAP, like grammar textbooks or uh, course textbooks. Sure. Um, well, I recently attended a, a session at TESOL, which was kind of a panorama of all the grammar textbooks out there. And the bottom line really is there's no perfect textbook. <laughs> mm, there's, a lot, nice <laughs> there's a lot of great <laughs> textbooks for us to... Um, and it's actually a good lesson to our students also. Um, you can't rely solely on your sources and your, your texts. You have to always rely on a combination of things. Hmm. Um, so, so there's a lot of good stuff out there. So you have to kind of pick and choose, not be too married to one text and choose what one text does really well and supplement. We do a lot of supplementing, don't we? And especially if you want authenticity, you have to always supplement. Hmm. At the moment, we should at least mention, at the moment in our level four class, we do use uh, an EAP text, which for receptive skills purposes has, I want to call them graded academic texts, both readings and listenings. Graded in the sense that they're uh, sort of truncated. The, the, the listenings aren't full 50-minute, one-hour lectures. Um, but they're, well, they're not truncated. They're still comprehensive, but just shortened, I guess. Uh, and then the readings furthermore tend to be from academic type sources, but don't necessarily represent the same rigor and, and level of academic vocabulary as you'd find in, in a peer reviewed journal, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. But just like the level five material, uh, each of the <clears throat> units that we use, uh, addresses a different academic discipline. And I think that's right. really important. Mm -hmm. And it's about scaff it's it's sort of like in the same way that you scaffold a writing assignment with with the stages in this case we're scaffolding receptive um, aptitude with with a an introductory type of it's a way of ramping it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sort of moving from um, an academic type reading or listening mm. in a textbook and then gradually, um, shall we say, weaning students off onto authentic, truly authentic right. readings and, and listenings. Yeah, and I think we start with shorter versions of the actual thing. Yeah, because, of the genre. Uh, exactly, right. in the same because when they get to university, they're going to read texts that are hundreds of pages long, and they're just not quite 
ready for that, but we want to show them the type of text they will encounter and maybe show them just some of the pages and how to tackle it. Okay. Um, and so another issue that we sometimes face um, in uh, EAP, receptive skills courses, is, you know, just how often, how much exposure are we going to give uh, students to a particular uh, resource, whether it's a reading or a listening? Um, Laura, do you have any comments on that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're definitely trying to wean them away from the hand-holding we kind of gave them in levels one to three. Um, so in levels one to three, we might let them listen to a passage three or four times. We would give them vocabulary in advance. We might even let them use subtitles in English for a listening passage. So by the time they get to level four, there's definitely no more um, access to subtitles. There's no uh, prep preparation activities before you listen. So we're trying to approximate more closely what they will encounter in degree studies. Well, I'm, I would maybe make more specific the idea of preparation. Uh, there is a kind of preparation that students are doing in the levels four and five, and that is uh, imitating the preparation that they will actually do in a credit right. course. So mm. students would not... Well, of course, students do go into a lecture unprepared, but their ability to glean from it what they need is going to be very limited. So we can teach them to be their own coaches, their own do their own preparation so that they know if they... This is one of the reasons I use textbook materials mm -hmm. to prepare for a lecture, because that's, in a way, what they will do mm -hmm. in their credit courses. They will read the textbook or read the articles that have been assigned, and then when they have the presentation, when they have the lecture by the professor, it's going to be so much clearer because they have that scaffolding they've done That's for true. themselves. Yeah. As well also when in level five, when they have a lecture that they're listening to, they might not have been given the vocabulary or the topic and know so much at the beginning, but still at the beginning there will be uh, notes, questions about what is the uh, speaker talking about, what's the general topic, and, and they'll actually be answering specific questions while they're doing the listening, but gradually through the course that will be taken away and so that there's less, their note taking has to be them coming up with, oh, what is the speaker trying to say and taking the essential notes by themselves rather than having these kind of bullet points of what should I be writing down already. So, We've talked a lot about uh, reading uh, articles and textbooks, uh, but to, to, what do you think, Breton? Is there a rule for extensive reading in EAP? Definitely, uh, I, I definitely agree. And, I, and then by extensive reading, I think you mean like uh, assigning a novel for a book report or for uh, for just blunt force reading exposure. And I think that there's definitely a place for that. Um, in our program, we don't tend to rely on that as much in EAP just because everything in our English for Academic Purposes program is designed to set students up for success in their degree studies. And not many of our degree studies students wind up in English literature or wind up writing um, a, a, like a, a, a literature type of essay, you know? So there, uh, it would be a little disingenuous of us to just to, to, to require that. Um, that said, there's still space for extensive reading of, of research. There's still, there's lots of space in, in our classes to um, include texts that require stages to complete them, I think, like th that you need to sit with or live with or, uh, or read over the course of a week, for example. I think that's a good experience to give our students. Um, but perhaps it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be literature. I guess. And certainly students, when they're doing their research, when they're preparing their research reports for AC, they are doing extensive reading of authentic, uh, no, no adaptation made whatsoever research that ha is, has been produced by scholars for other scholars and certainly not uh, something that's going to be short or, of course, they can always read the abstract and uh, get the quick overview, but then they've got mm -hmm. to tackle that 10 or 15 or maybe even a 20-page uh, research paper that they need in order to produce their own research. There's enough generative space in our, in our curricula, I think, 
um, in in levels four at least, perhaps not in level five, but to to allow for students to propose uh, an assignment or to propose an idea to their teacher, up, and when they get approval, mm. advance with it. So, for example, uh, they could write a critical review about a text and extensive reading, as opposed to critically reviewing an article or or another 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 source text. Um, if they feel that this would be valuable to themselves. So if they make enough of a case and seem to have gone about the, the task, you know, well enough, then yeah, fill your boots, as they say. But yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess uh, I'll, I'll add in that in level five, we have uh, an independent project. And so if a right. student really wanted to do a novel study or something, there would be the room for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, as we wrap up our discussion on uh, receptive skills, I just wanted to uh, us to think for a moment about how uh, receptive skills lessons and productive skills lessons dovetail. Um, you know, sort of how do they fit together? How do AA and AC, as we call them, uh, academic analysis and academic communication, how do they fit together? Um, I would say that definitely at the beginning of the term, we, we definitely try to plan uh, what's the topic that we're going to be choosing for? Maybe there's four topics that will be uh, discussed throughout the term. And so therefore, uh, the AC and a, a teacher will uh, talk together and see, well, from the textbook, what type of listenings and readings will we do to cover that topic so that the background material is there for the AC teacher to carry on with and create discussion in seminars or to have the material there to start doing writings or summaries about them. Um, And again, it's going to be very important that the teachers are communicating well between each other so that there is a good uh, timeline so that listening and receptive skills are there um, so that the teachers can coordinate that well together. I have to say that I look forward to a new unit being added into our our mix to make the circulation. So um, I was fascinated by the sociology unit on crime. Uh, so I read even beyond what the students were reading. But it was uh, it was it was really exciting as well as an instructor to see how. Um, the, the materials were being presented to them on the one side, and of course, and I went and I read all of the materials that the AA instructor was presenting, and I looked at the lectures, and then I brought them into the assignments as I had the students uh, write an in-class writing, uh, giving a, perhaps giving a, a, a response to a particular reading, getting them to see that, oh, I have this other background material. So because the material, because the two classes are fitting together in the same academic discipline, they're getting a much deeper uh, level of understanding than if we each used, each class used its own set of materials. Um, there's a connection between receptive skills instruction and productive skills instruction from a student perspective as well. Um, for example, uh, I think earlier in the discussion we mentioned using models um, as a way of sort of setting the standard, as it were, for A, communication, but B, also for academic um, for academic culture, really, for rhetorical, uh, um, rhetorical culture. Uh, and so f- from a receptive point of view, uh, in, a, in a listening and, or reading class, um, students are given a model essay uh, to um, critically appraise. Perhaps it's very well written, in which case the instructor is likely intending for them to you know, in, in, uh, internalize the functional and rhetorical strategies here. They're, this is a really good example of a topic sentence. And look how nicely the paragraph coheres to that topic. Uh, look at the inter-paragraph structure. So there's all sorts of points that you could bring, about, bring out about a good, par- a, a good model. Uh, essay. Uh, similarly, you know, you can you can set the standard in a negative way by by introducing um, uh, you know ways that people have <laughs> have really uh, have really fallen short of of a, of a good standard essay. Um, and then the productive piece is to to turn around and be able to apply mm-hmm. those principles that you learned from from receptive skills instruction. Mm-hmm. And I think the same would be, although you've used. Um, uh, reading uh, as an example, uh, pieces of writing as an example, the mm. same could be true with, here's a good example of a, of a presentation, yeah. here's a bad example of a presentation. <laughs> yeah. 
We did that a little bit with TED Talks. Recently I had them listen to a TED Talk and then they had to summarize the TED Talk and present the the synopsis of what they heard. And part of the part of what I asked them was, is this a good presenter? Why, why not? Did he have a hook? Did he or she have an opening hook? Did they have a good conclusion? Did they use body language? So they really kind of took that apart. They're very quick to notice which speakers speak way too fast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you. I'm sure we could go on and on about receptive skills, but I think we'll say that that is enough mm. for today. So thank you all for uh, sharing your thoughts on receptive skills. Yeah, thank you, Glenda. Thank you, thank you. Glenda.